Sorry. Uh, so we're here with uh, Randy and Bob, and uh, today's statement for our debate is going to be that a sound economy requires market chosen money outside of the control of government. With that, we're going to start with uh, Robert Murphy taking the affirmative. Thanks for hosting this debate, and thanks to everyone who's tuning in and watching this live. Uh, so because uh, Professor Ray represents the MMT school and I represent the Austrian school, I imagine a lot of this debate is going to center around our differing views on technical economics and what causes business cycles and so forth. But before I get into sort of the technical economics of it and our dispute there, let me first just uh, sort of frame this and say that the, the, re the fundamental reason that I support the proposition, namely a sound economy requires market chosen money outside the control of government, isn't so much about technical economics, but rather more political philosophy. So let me read this quote to you folks uh, from Ludwig von Mises. And here he's talking about the idea of sound money in the classical liberal tradition. So Mises says, it is impossible to grasp the meaning of the idea of sound money if one does not realize that it was devised as an instrument for the protection of civil liberties against despotic inroads on the part of governments. Ideologically, it belongs in the same class with political constitutions and bills of rights. The demand for constitutional guarantees and for bills of rights was a reaction against arbitrary rule and the not observance of old customs by kings. The postulate of sound money was first brought up as a response to the princely practice of debasing the coinage. It was later carefully elaborated and perfected in the age which had learned what a government can do to a nation's currency system. Okay, so what Mises is getting at there is saying that the idea of sound money, and by that Mises meant hard commodity money like gold and silver and just let the market choose the money and um, you know banks can issue notes and so forth tied to that but the government stays out of it and it's market produced money what Mises was saying there is that the reason the classical liberals favored that wasn't simply a matter of they had studied the economic literature and decided ah we can have longer uh, or higher long-term growth if we use a gold standard as opposed to paper fiat money that wasn't the issue. The issue was more of how do you protect the public or the citizenry from having their wealth stolen by the king? And in, you know, from just age immemorial, what had happened was the princes, when they had a war or they had other expenses, they would debase the coinage. And what did that mean? That means melting down the coins and then putting in a baser metal. Okay. And so that would cause inflation and so on. But the point was, how do you protect against that? They're saying, keep the money away from politics, separation of money and state, as it were. And so likewise, I would ask you to think just as we would want to have a free press, right? Like a, a sound um, society requires market produced newspapers and so forth outside the control of government, right? We'd all agree with that. We wouldn't want the government controlling the news. We wouldn't want the government controlling science, right? A, a, a sound society requires science that's not politicized, that's independent from government interference. So likewise, just in, those, in that sense, the institution of money, clearly you'd want politics to stay away from that. How could you trust government officials with that sort of power? Okay, so what I wanna say here is that, and I'm sure we're gonna get into the arguments here and I, I can respond more concretely once I hear exactly what uh, Professor Ray is gonna say to us, but even if he establishes in theory, oh, government officials, if they handled themselves and conducted monetary policy according to the way he and other proponents of MMT would advise, and that that would be the theoretically best of all worlds, I want to say that's not enough, right? That in practice, the issue is if we give politicians control of the printing press, are they actually going to do the responsible thing? Just look at this upcoming election in the United States right now. Which side do you want to give the printing press to? The side of Donald Trump or the side of Joe Biden? I don't want to give it to either of those camps. Right? And I think it's very naive if Professor Ray tries to make this merely about the, the technical economics and to say, oh, no, you know, we, we can trust the government to get it right with fiat money as long as they did X, Y, and Z with it, which I'm imagining he's going to make a case for that. And again, I'll certainly be happy to, when I get to respond, point out why I think he's wrong, even in theory, 
But my point is, even if you thought that were up in the air or you even were convinced by him, that still doesn't establish the truth of the proposition that we're debating today. Another way of seeing this is that when you leave the choice of the money commodity up to free individuals in the marketplace, in a sense, it's, it's more robust. Okay, so it's true. I think market produced money. And by the way, let me just mention the market produced money. Okay, it was free people who spontaneously, as it were, settled upon monies, like money emerged spontaneously. It wasn't that a wise king invented money. And right now in these opening remarks, I don't have time to go into that history, but I, I do want to say the market is how money arose originally. And then it was the government process that came in and sort of co-opted it and then eventually you know, pushed it out entirely such that we now have the current system of government fiat money. But for example, and just in case you don't know the history, dollars, French francs, German marks, and so on, originally the reason people held those was because they were redeemable in either gold or silver, depending on the time period. And that's how people came to value those things. And it was only later that governments severed the link to the precious metals. Okay, so originally people used commodity money and government produced money that, and then eventually fiat money was a later innovation. And I would say a bad one. Okay, so one way to see, I'm returning to my earlier point here, one way to understand the robustness of this is that by leaving it up to freedom that let people choose, if something looks to be very risky, then people can get out of it, okay? Whereas if you're using government coercion to force a whole society to use a particular money, as long as the government technocrats do a good job, okay, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe even Professor Ray's gonna try to argue it's better than what the anarchic market would have produced on its own. But my point here is, when it goes bad with government produced fiat money, it's awful. Namely, you get hyperinflation, the collapse of the currency. So say what you will about the gold standard or even better, like just gold coins that are directly produced without any government involvement at all. And so that's just gold being the money or silver or whatever commodity you want. Or of course, for the fans of cryptocurrency, letting people you know, use whatever currencies they want, Bitcoin or the more uh, recent innovations say what you will about those things, but you're not going to get something as catastrophic as the German hyperinflation between the two world wars or what's happened in Zimbabwe or what's happening in Venezuela, right? That stuff only happens, those mass large scale hyperinflations that just wipe out the, the middle class and lead to all sorts of social chaos and economic destruction. That sort of carnage can only happen when a government has arrogated to itself the decision, oh no, we know what's best. We're going to impose the money on the whole economy and then they screw it up. They print way too much of it. So I grant that I'm sure Professor Ray is going to say well, how he has criteria so that we never get there with MMT. Fair enough. But my point is you're just always leaving that possibility open when you give government this tremendous power that, that no institution should have to dictate what money the whole society should be using. Now, even putting aside cases like the German hyperinflation or Zimbabwe, what have you, even if we talk about the United States, which is relatively responsible and has a decent track record as far as these things go, still, it's important to realize that the history of what happened under the Federal Reserve is abysmal. So let me just show you some statistics here. From 1879 to 1914, there was cumulatively virtually zero price inflation or deflation, namely what a, something that cost $100 in 1879 in the year 1914, that bundle of goods would cost about $99.95. So there's actually a tiny little bit of price deflation over that long span, all right? Since the foundation of the Fed, of course, the dollar has lost, depending on which statistic you look at, something like 99% of its purchasing power, okay? Um, perhaps a little bit less, depending on which price uh, index you use, but still losing most of it over that history. Furthermore, it's not merely that price inflation is larger, it's also more volatile. Furthermore, Real output is more volatile since the founding of the Fed. Consider this, the Great Depression and the Great Recession, the two worst economic calamities, happened on the Fed's watch. So I could ask, what more would have to happen for people to realize that the creation of a central bank, far from providing monetary stability and, economic, and steady and smooth economic growth to avoid the wild ups and downs that allegedly would happen under a, uh, you know, a free market, 
clearly the Federal Reserve fails on all those counts, and this is using objective economic measures. All right. Last thing I'll mention here is in the Austrian tradition, the cause of business cycles is monetary inflation pushes interest rates down to an artificially low level that stimulates a false boom, an unsustainable boom that leads to a bust. It's the only way to get rid of this boom bust cycle is to take money in banking and give it back to the private sector. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with that, uh, we'll turn it over to Randall Ray taking the opposition. Okay, first, uh, we're not gonna have time to go through the history in detail. I think much of this is a uh, fantasy history. Uh, money has actually always been a debt. The um, authorities have always played a role in developing the monetary system. <laughs> the money of account has um, always been chosen by authorities. Now authorities may be despotic. They also may be democratic. Um, so it, there's just too much there. Uh, the way that I see money is as uh, first and foremost, a unit of account. Uh, when a new nation is adopted, the first thing that they do is choose a money of account. Uh, the government issues the currency. Uh, there are very few exceptions throughout history. If we go back in time, 4,000, 6,000 years, or go around the world today, in almost every case, uh, the government chooses the money of account and issues the currency denominated in that money of account and imposes obligations in that money of account. So this is what we call a sovereign currency, and this is the basis of all the monetary systems that we know of going back to Babylonian times. <clears throat> um, the, uh, it's true that there have been occasions in which governments have pegged their currency to gold. Uh, today, we see some countries that peg their domestic currencies to a foreign currency, often to the US dollar but it could also be to the Euro. Um, and in those particular cases, it is true that their currencies are redeemable for the thing that they have pegged to, gold or US dollars in the case of, let's say, Ecuador. Uh, we see this as an aberration. Uh, it is an exception to the rule, and it is usually a disaster. Uh, the gold standard that he was talking about that we had in place in the 19th century, uh, and Bob noted that we sort of begin and end uh, the gold standard uh, era with the same price level. But what he left out is there was great variability over the course of time of the price level. Prices collapsed in depressions. The whole 1870s was a depression decade. The whole 1890s was a depression uh, decade, prices collapsed, and then they rose rapidly when we were not in depression. So it's true, if you look at the endpoints, it looks like, hey, prices were stable. They weren't stable at all. Okay. Uh, we had a crisis in 1907, and that uh, led to the impetus to create a central bank. We call it the Fed in the United States. The United States was way behind, hundreds of years behind the creation of central banks. And we actually had uh, the most volatile uh, history of banking uh, in comparison to the countries that had central banks. So central banks can help stabilize. Now, I am very critical of the Fed. The, the, the Fed has continually failed us. So I agree with that 100%. <clears throat> um, the Fed failed us in the 1930s. The uh, Fed uh, failed us in 2007. We went into the global financial crisis. I think the Fed continues to make bad uh, policy decisions ever since 2007. So I'm not a big defender of the Fed. However, I, I would prefer to have a central bank uh, tie their hands much uh, in a much more constraining manner. And I think that uh, Bob would agree with that. Um, I would take away most of their responsibilities. Um, but that doesn't mean that I believe that we can get by with a purely private financial system. Uh, what underlies 
our financial system in the United States is the US dollar. And uh, the, uh, our constitution gives to Congress the sole power to issue the currency. And um, it underlies the financial system. Um, most of our financial system, uh, probably 99.9% .9 of our financial system is already basically private for profit uh, operating uh, to earn profits for the institutions that issue the vast uh, uh, majority of um, our money supply. Now, a large part of that is backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. And uh, probably Bob and I would agree that a lot of this backing uh, leads to uh, uh, excessive risk, risk taking. And so I think that we should probably also peel back some of that. Um, the, in every crisis, the Fed backstops more and more of the private financial system, which encourages risk taking uh, behavior and creating new kinds of financial liabilities that are uh, seen to be very liquid until we have a crisis. And then the whole thing collapse. The Fed bails it out and rinse and repeat. And we go back to doing what we were doing before. So I think that we do have serious problems with our financial system, but they are not because we have a system based on the US dollar. Uh, I don't, I haven't been keeping track of my time. Uh, so let me just finish with, um, what <clears throat> MMT says, because in this pandemic, uh, suddenly everyone, almost everybody, not the Austrians, but aside from the Austrians, almost everybody embraced MMT. And it, the, the turnaround was just unbelievable uh, fast. So if we go back to February, every, uh, Politician, Congress, every central banker around the world had to weigh in against MMT. Oh, MMT is crazy. We would never do what they uh, supposedly are telling us to do. Then the pandemic hits and all of them say, we're gonna adopt MMT now. What is MMT? MMT is fly helicopters around and drop money everywhere. So we got the Trump checks. Everybody goes out to the mailbox, they pull a check out of the uh, mailbox. This is MMT. Well, it's not MMT. We did not recommend that. We did not think it was a good idea. I still don't think it was a good idea. Uh, MMT explains how the monetary system actually works. And this should be useful even for Austrians. I once wrote a blog saying MMT is for Austrians too. Uh, we want you to understand how the monetary system works. We don't agree with your, um, your politics, but if you want to reform the, the monetary system um, and you can get the political support for the policies that you want, you ought to at least understand how the monetary system works so that you can use it in your interest. Now, I hope you, you don't succeed. Uh, I hope that uh, progressive democracy will eventually win out and that we will elect a Congress and a, a president uh, that is progressive and that wants to pursue the public interest. Um, and uh, we'll use MMT to inform their policymaking. So that would be my preference, but I think everyone ought to understand uh, how the economy actually works. So what MMT actually says is that a sovereign government cannot run out of its own money uh, that it can afford to buy anything that is for sale. Our danger is that the government might try to spend too much. So we do worry about that. I know Bob worries about that. Austrians worry about that. Uh, that has been fundamental to uh, our analysis from the very beginning. We worry about inflation. And we just argue that what we need to do is be very careful. Um, and in spite of the claim that you know, if Congress really understood MMT, hey, we can't run out of money, 
And what Congress would do is immediately spend without limit. But I've talked to a number of Congress people over the years, over the past 30 years, meeting with them, explaining how MMT works. And many of them actually do get it. They say, no, we can't say that in public, but we understand what you're saying. Uh, none of them wants inflation. I've never met any congressperson, Democrat or Republican, who wants inflation. They understand that that would be the problem. And so this idea that you know, we need to lie to our politicians, we need to lie to the voters, because if they knew the truth, the government can't run out of money, they would spend without limit. So, uh, I just don't believe that story. I haven't met a single Congress person who wants to do that. Okay, I know my time is up, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Randy, I appreciate that. So with that, Bob, you have five minutes for your rebuttal. Okay, great. So as, as Randy says, unfortunately, some of this stuff is just we're arguing about the historical record. So let me just clarify, of course, I agree that sovereign, like modern states have declared like what the sovereign unit of currency would be in their, within their jurisdictions. But what I was claiming is that historically, those were always tied to the precious metals. And certainly um, the ones that people think of nowadays, even the constituents of the Euro, I'm saying those things were all originally you know, like, like think of the pound sterling, right? Where's that name even come from? It's because the British currency used to be a, a, a pound of silver. And then of course they were, you know, weakening that or diluting that over time. But so that's, that's what my point was. It was only until the you know, world war one, basically when it was, it was really abandoned for large scale. And then it never quite got back to the classical uh, gold standard era. And then of course, Bretton Woods, it was just the U.S. was still on gold, everybody else tied to the dollar. And then finally, 1971 is when it was the, the, they threw in the towel. OK, but so my point being, for those who just didn't know that history, that, that's what I was was explaining. Um, just to make sure I don't miss this point, probably the most critical thing there that what Randy said at the end was, hey, we don't need to worry that, you know, don't listen to these fear mongers saying if, if we openly acknowledge and to the Congress and whatnot, and, and they get them to realize they there's never a sense in which they can not be able to afford something. The issue was always just going to be the ultimate resource constraint, and might that um, you know push CPI up too much? And he was saying, I've never talked to a Congress person who wanted inflation. Well, then I would ask, why do we have inflation then? Right? Because clearly we've had bouts of bad inflation, and certainly other countries have had hyperinflations. All right, so. I'm sure too that if you talked to the political officials around Europe as of 1913, none of them wanted to have a bloody war that would lead to millions of casualties. But yet that's what happened when you entrust the war making power to governments. Okay, so I'm sure that nobody wants to be irresponsible. And if they say, oh, yeah, we would, we would stop spending, you know, once we saw price inflation was getting too high. But I'm saying already it shows the system doesn't constrain that. And I think that the more we, try to get people to see the insights of MMT that would just open the floodgates even more so. So I guess in terms of the economics of it, the fundamental difference between Randy and me is that I want to just state the sort of obvious fact that the government, the, the monetary system per se does not create real resources. All right. That, and, and I know he, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't disagree with me here, and so my claim is simply that the function of money, like what is it that money does for us? Why do we need money? I'm going to say it helps coordinate economic exchanges. That, um, that it, it helps for, you know, to rearrange resources in mutually advantageous ways. If we just had barter, then, you know, there only be direct exchanges where each, you know, two people at a given time, you have what I want and I have what you want and we swap. Those sorts of things could still have more complex exchanges where people like transfer around in a chain, as it were, those sorts of things would be a lot harder to coordinate. And that's one of the things money gives us. And then the ultimate thing that money gives us that you appreciate if you've studied Austrian economics is it allows for what's called economic calculation. That by having most things in the economy trade against a single commodity, that allows for objective market prices, so we can have accountants look at an enterprise and see what are the costs 
and what are the revenues and decide, is this operation profitable? In a world of barter, you, that would be very difficult to do because you'd have all kinds of disparate inputs and disparate outputs in different heterogeneous goods and services. And you, you wouldn't know. You'd look at a factory and look at all the glass and rubber and labor hours going into it and all the cars coming out and say, is this a good use of society's scarce resources? How would you know? This is the socialist calculation problem. And so in a private property society using money, you solve that because the money provide, allows for economic calculation. And so you can just reduce all the inputs to their cost, reduce all the outputs to their revenue and see is revenue higher than cost. Okay, so that's what money does for us. And so there's, there's not all these other things that are on the table that we're not able to grasp because we're not taking advantage of MMT. And so I'm saying by giving money over to the government and allowing them to print more and fund programs that they think are important and socially useful, you're just debasing that fundamental function of money and causing the business cycle and mass inflation. Thank you very much, Bob. And with that, five minutes for your rebuttal, Randy. Okay. Um, well, I, I still think the history shows decisively that money has always been nominal. Uh, it, has, it has never been a commodity. Uh, we can peg the price of a commodity. That's what a gold standard is. It's not that gold is money. It's that we have pegged the price of gold. The government stands ready to buy or sell gold. We could choose a different commodity. Now, I think that uh, that is a problem. It's problematic because uh, generally capitalist economies grow. I mean, that's the good thing about them. They, and they can grow very rapidly. Um, and they need a growing money supply. The, the problem with gold is it's a fairly limited resource. And yes, occasionally uh, you come across new discoveries of gold but they don't necessarily come at the right time. And so you need a much more flexible uh, supply of money to do the kinds of things that Bob was talking about. Um, simply pegging the price of one commodity does not ensure at all that the prices of all the other things you buy are not going up in price or going down in price. It does not ensure stability of the overall price level. It ensures stability of that one thing you are uh, pegging the price of. Um, so there have been other proposals that try to deal with this, such as, well, let's peg the price of a commodity basket instead, rather than one single commodity. And that helps to, to resolve some of those problems. Um, but in any case, these are rare experiments. They never last. Countries always go off gold standards uh, in the very first significant crisis, uh, precisely because they don't uh, give you the elastic supply of currency that you need to deal with a crisis. That's why you go off gold standards in crises. And so we see these as very problematic, exceptions to the rule and problematic when you do it on them. Um, the, uh, we are not advocating in any way whatsoever giving money over to the government. Okay? We are not advocating the government replacing uh, private money, replacing private initiative, replacing private property. We're just saying that uh, we have a democratic form of government. We elect representatives. They are supposed to operate in public purpose. Nothing is ideal in this world, <laughs> okay? They, they may come somewhat close to that, okay, in the best of times. And what we're saying is that we define the public purpose. Okay, this is what government ought to do. We identify the resources that are necessary, let's say for a, a Green New Deal or just to fight the COVID or to fight a world war, which we've done twice. Uh, identify the resources you need. Uh, we can always find the finance. So there was no question about the government's ability to finance World War II. The US government uh, eventually grew to be 50% of GDP the government's deficit reached 25% of GDP. 
the outstanding government debt stock reached 100 percent of GDP. And uh, there, are, uh, there are MMTers who have looked at the internal records of the government. Were they ever concerned they were going to run out of money? And the answer is absolutely not. They were worried about running out of resources. They were focused on the right thing. How will we move enough resources to the war effort to win the war? That was the only question. And I would say with the Green New Deal, same thing. The pandemic, same thing. The problem is not money. Thank you very much. So at this point, uh, the original schedule we had worked out was that I was going to ask you guys two questions, but based on how in-depth your answers have gone, I'm going to cut that to just one. Um, and I'm going to ask, give each one of you guys five minutes to sort of address it. And that question is this. Um, this is sort of uh, something that I think a lot about and personally find fascinating. In the, let's say, neoliberal era sort of that we live in globally right now, one of the major problems that we've seen in the United States and in the West in general is essentially a surplus of labor in Western nations. And that hasn't always uh, manifested itself in the form of per se unemployment, although at times it certainly has. Uh, in other situations, it's manifested itself just in terms of you know, working class people having severely depressed wages, um, or both of those things sometimes happen at the same time. So one of the I think things that a lot of a lot of uh, theorists that look at money through the MMT lens are famous for is um, favoring a jobs guarantee to partially deal with that issue. It's one of the things that many MMT proponents are, uh, I guess, most famous for is probably the best way to put it. So I want to start, Bob, by giving you five minutes to discuss, you know, I assume why you think a jobs guarantee is not a good idea. Um, and why, what, how a sound money system would deal with that problem. And then I'm going to give uh, Randy five minutes to sort of rebut. So with that, let's turn it over to you, Bob. Okay, great. Um, so it's, I'm going to, I read uh, Stephanie Kelton's latest book. And so I'm going to assume that what Randy favors is, is comparable. Maybe the numbers are different, but if what, if the context here is we're talking about the federal government sort of having this standing offer saying um, anybody who wants to can always get a job for such and such $12 an hour, let's say, and that's sort of a backstop in that, you know, that, that way we know there's never going to be any unemployment necessarily, um, but, or at least anyone who is out of work will just because it's voluntary on their part. And, and we know we can afford to do that because, hey, as MMT teaches us, there's an unlimited number of dollars we can create. And the only issue would be, is it going to lead to unacceptably high price inflation? So that's the context of what I assume you're talking about. So yes, I'm strongly opposed to such a policy. Um, one way to look at it is just exaggerate it, right? So suppose they bump the numbers up to $200 an hour. I think everybody could see why that would be a bad idea, right? Because then everybody in the economy, except for star athletes and movie stars and maybe brain surgeons or whatever, would quit their current job and just take the government guaranteed job. And that would just reduce to central planning where the government's telling everyone where to work. And presumably we realize that that's not a good idea. That's an inefficient system. And so then you say, okay, but we're not talking about 200. We're talking about lower level. And my point is, well, if you make it so low that people would rather just be conventionally unemployed, then it's not helping. But then the higher you you bump it up, then the more you are running into this issue. And for it to be an actual, you know, a job guarantee, meaning anybody can get this thing who wants it. I mean, for it to be that open-ended, it seems to me they can't be too strict about it, right? So like, what if somebody shows up to work at the, at the guaranteed job and the person's drunk? Can they be sent home? Do they still get paid? What if they just don't show up habitually? Or what if they always roll in 45 minutes late and they're, you know, and they're hung over? So that's the, the kind of thing where, you know, it's, it's not clear to me. And I've never seen it spelled out carefully. Like, and, and, and once you start going down the path of, oh, come on, we're not talking about ridiculous cases like that, Murphy, we're, we'll, we would have policies. We'd leave it to the local managers to make decisions. Well, then it starts just turning into the government's going to hire some people to do something and it's not a guarantee. Okay. So say what you will about uh, Yang's UBI proposal at least there, they were just flat out admitting, no, we're just sending people checks without tying it to work because then you get all that baggage um, that, that comes with it. So um, in terms of the economics of it, to the extent that the government then does have 
a certain segment of the labor force that it's siphoning away from the private sector, again, I would say, why would we trust the political process to better allocate labor resources than the private sector? And so that would be inefficient just on, on those grounds alone. Now, of course, I think the, the response will be, and, the, and even just regular people watching would say, okay, that might make sense in a normal market economy at full employment, but come on, we're talking about, as, and as you as the, as the question suggested, we're talking here about the fact that the market doesn't seem to work. We've got these long spells of either unemployment or underemployment, and that's the sort of thing we're trying to cure. We tried laissez-faire capitalism, Murphy, and it doesn't work. So here, this is why I think the Austrian school's insights are so important, is that I think that the Austrian school has given the best explanation of what causes the boom-bust cycle. And so if the Austrians are right, then the kind of remedy that's being proposed here, and more generally, the MMT idea of just inflating the money supply so long as we haven't hit the apparent resource, real resource constraint, is just going to exacerbate the problem. Instead of it being medicine, it's going to be poison. So again, just to recapitulate, I alluded to it briefly before, in the Austrian view, interest rates are prices that serve a function. They communicate information. They help coordinate decisions among savers, households, business people to determine how long investment projects should they invest in. Other things equal lower interest rates, allow for businesses to invest in longer term projects because now they appear more profitable using like a present and discounted value framework, the lower the discount rate you're applying to the future. And so if the government, usually through the central bank, floods the market with cheap credit and it pushes down interest rates below what they ought to be, that sets up an unsustainable boom. And then once the crash occurs, which is necessary, yes, there's a temporary period where resources have to get reallocated. So it's that boom bust cycle that chronically leads to people consistently being underemployed and if the government stopped intervening and just let the system wash out, then they would reach their long-term niches where it would be sustainable, right? So the government coming in and just offering a job guarantee just siphons people out of that process and has them doing something that's not socially as valuable. Thank you very much, Bob. And with that, I will turn it over to Randy. Okay. Um, so the job guarantee program would be funded by the national government it would um, set a minimum wage. Uh, Bob mentioned 12, uh, we've been using 15 because there is a national movement to raise the minimum wage to $15. The point is that whatever wage the program pays would become the nationwide effective minimum wage. For a private employer to retain workers, they would need to match the $15 an hour, whatever the program pays, um, or offer uh, some other kinds of rewards to make it worthwhile to take a lower paying job. Okay, so it becomes the effective national minimum wage. Um, any employer who wants to hire workers can always hire them out of this program by paying $15.10 an hour, okay? So it's not that the government is removing these people from the labor force, the, 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 they are always available to be hired by the private sector uh, at the minimum wage. Um, now, you use the example of $200 an hour, or you know, we could use an example of $1 an hour. If you set the wage far away from what is sort of the going minimum wage, the realistic minimum wage at which employers can hire workers today, then it will be more disruptive. Setting it at $1 an hour would be disruptive. Also setting it at $200 an hour would be disruptive. Eventually, the economy will settle at that new minimum wage, whatever the program is paying, okay? Um, so you're, there's sort of a trade-off between how disruptive do you want to be, $200 an hour, uh, versus what you perceive to be much less disruptive, but at least a living wage. And so that's why we have settled on $15 an hour. Um, they, what happens if they show up Trump? Well, they're fired. They have to meet normal uh, work standards, uh, which should be no different than what they are with private uh, employers. 
uh, you can fire them with cause, okay? And, uh, you know, maybe you give them a second chance and a third chance, and then after that, you say, sorry, you know, uh, you're not eligible for this program anymore. Um, so they've got to show up to work ready and willing to work. Um, now, we do envision that there will be some flexibility. Uh, the vast majority of people living with disabilities want jobs. Uh, unfortunately, the majority of them cannot find jobs in the private sector. So we would see a role uh, in, in the job guarantee program for providing jobs that accommodate people with disabilities and so on, okay? Uh, we're not talking about keeping drunks on the job, okay? Um, we want them to do useful things. We want them to do things that are in the public interest. Uh, and uh, we have written a lot on this. So anyone who's interested can go to the Levy website they can see our job guarantee proposal. Stephanie uh, Kelvin was one of the co-authors and they can see work by Pavlina Chernema, which goes through the list of the kinds of jobs that they can do. Uh, finally, this um, program, not only is it a full employment program, so anyone can get a job at the going wage in the, in the um, uh, program, I mean, as long as they show up ready and willing to work, um, but it helps to stabilize the economy. It help, helps to stabilize wages. It puts a floor on wages. It helps stabilize wages in the upward direction because private employers can always recruit out of the program. You've got workers showing up, demonstrating their readiness and willingness to work, uh, who can be hired out of the program by paying slightly more than what the program pays. It helps to stabilize the economy because as the private sector, let's say, goes into a financial crisis and starts shedding workers, those workers don't become unemployed. They can go into this program and continue to work at the minimum wage. That helps to stabilize employment, which stabilizes consumption, which to some degree helps to stabilize firm revenues, helps to stabilize investment. Uh, so it acts as a countervailing force to keep the economy uh, moving along. Um, and finally, it can be used to increase uh, productivity of uh, our economy by doing useful things, contributing to uh, public infrastructure defined very broadly. I, I'm not, I, I, we don't have in mind just repeating what the New Deal did, which employed 13 million people, developed the US economy. The US was an underdeveloped country in 1930. The, the New Deal programs created 13 million jobs and built our country. They built our infrastructure. Uh, probably most of these jobs are going to be in the service sector, uh, not in building dams and highways and so on. Uh, we don't really need uh, the, the job guarantee program to do those sorts of things. Those are usually done by private contractors uh, paid by the government. But we can increase productivity of our economy uh, by um, uh, putting people to work in the, the care sectors, care for people, care for the environment, care for communities. All of those can also help to increase productivity. I don't see a message yet. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're, you've, uh, okay. you've hit your time. I'm there, okay, that's good. Thank you very much, Randy, I appreciate it. And uh, honestly, I wish we could have an, an entire debate just on the jobs guarantee, but alas, we only have so much time. So at this point, we're going to jump to Bob for a three minute closing statement and then Randy for his three minutes and then we will be out of time. Okay, so let me just follow up the train of thought there on the job guarantee stuff. So what Randy said, so yes, he was $15. I think that I know that was Stephanie. I didn't know um, if he was on board with it. Okay, so $15 an hour. So notice he's saying, oh, that's that's not, anyone who wants to hire, you know, pay more. So even so, there's plenty of people right now working in the private sector who don't earn $15 an hour. And I would say that's not because of, you know, exploitation or just the, the ex, you know, the, the vagaries of the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. I would say that's because their productivity for whatever reason is not higher than $15 an hour. And so that's why they're getting paid what they are getting paid less than that. And so when the government if it comes along and institutes a $15 uh, job guarantee, lots of people are going to flock to that program. And so those individuals will be better off. But the point being that now 
output's going to be less because by stipulation, those people are not, their, their output isn't worth $15 an hour. If it were, then you wouldn't need to have the government come and hire them. The private sector would have done so. All right. So, it, but now you're losing out on the, what they were producing for the private sector. Let's say they were getting paid $9 an hour. And my point is just because the government's paying them 15, I don't trust the political process to actually have them producing something that's worth more than nine. All right. Just in general, the government's very inefficient at things. All right. So th that's the, the issue there, but it's worse than that. There could be people making, let's say, $18 an hour, but the job's really stressful or it's really difficult and they're, you know, it's bad working conditions, but they're saying, hey, but I make $18 an hour, that's pretty good money. Whereas the job guarantee, in order for it to be a guarantee, that's got to be a pretty cushy job, right? If it were the kind of thing where people wouldn't want to take it, even though they were getting $15 an hour, then it really wouldn't be a job guarantee or people would gripe and say, come on, this is a bait and switch. Okay, so that's one of the issues there as well. Now, stepping back for the debate as a whole here, for the proposition as a whole, notice what Randy said there at a couple of points. He was saying, oh, the reason the Fed was introduced was we want to have an elastic currency that deals with financial crises. Right. That, that was the ostensible reason. And my point was, by any objective measurement, and just for the layman, the fact that the Great Depression happened soon after the Fed was introduced and the Great Recession decades later shows that going to the Fed did not solve this alleged problem with the gold standard that, oh, we need an elastic currency to deal with crises. No, crises have gotten worse. And even just standard measures of like the volatility of real output, you know, using econometrics, it's worse. All right. So all in all, I would say that um, what Randy has, has admitted, and he even admitted that, you know, he doesn't like what the Fed's done in practice. So that's kind of my point that at best he's showing in theory, maybe if they took his advice going forward, things would be better. But clearly the historical record shows leave money to the market and it's not going to commit the same abuses that the government will. Thank you very much, Bob. And Randy, a hard three minutes for you. Okay. Let, let me start with the last point. So yes, the Fed comes in in 1913. Uh, we had the Great Depression. Uh, 1930s. We went until 2007 with no depressions. Um, and the, the global financial crisis, this was serious. I'm not downplaying it all. It still didn't quite rise to a Great Depression. Go back to the 19th century before we had the Fed. We had five depressions. Five. We've had one since, plus global financial crisis. Okay. Compare the two centuries and the, the, it's pretty obvious which one is more stable um, and which one had much uh, more rapid growth. Uh, the period from 1920 to 1970, uh, the U.S. grew faster than did by far compared to any other uh, period in U.S. history. Um, the, yes, the Fed fails up. I mean, it's this institution when it really screws up badly, we give it more responsibility. Okay, that is a huge mistake. And there's been this worship of the Fed since probably around 1970 that is completely misplaced. And for a long time, uh, economists and policymakers sort of abandoned fiscal policy and said the Fed can do everything. And that is pure nonsense. So I, uh, I am very critical of the Fed and we need to greatly ramp down the Fed's uh, power. Now on the, the job guarantee, I know I probably have less than one minute. Um, look, uh, jobs, if somebody works full time at a job, they ought to earn a living wage, period. And I don't have much sympathy for the argument that uh, we should support private employers who can only pay seven fifty an hour. And the, the fallout is on all of us of such low pay that people can't possibly support their families. Anyone who works ought to have a living wage. And that's what the $15 an hour minimum wage uh, movement is all about. And look, it's gonna be much easier for businesses to be successful if workers have living wages. It's going to be much easier to sell stuff to them if they have living wages. And the cost to society 
of supporting extremely low paid people and unemployed people will be much lower. Awesome. Thank you very much, Randy. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I think we had a really good debate here today and thank you to BTC Media. Thanks for having us.